Hi. Hi. My name's Sophia. I'm with the Office of Care and Civility. I'm here today with Shannon from our Center for Academic Performance. Hi. Happy to be here. We're going to go over some tips and tricks from CAP on how to tackle test anxiety, especially as we head into midterm season and final season and all those exams and board prep. So, Shannon, what resources or support services does CAP offer for students experiencing test anxiety? So we do one-on-one -on -one appointments with students. Um, they can book with us through Simplicity to meet with a learning specialist. That is usually going to be my first recommendation, simply so we can sort of diagnose exactly where the testing anxiety is coming from. If it is stemming from a place of struggling to understand content, then we might look at setting the student up with some tutoring services, helping them work with their peers as well, kind of coaching them through how to do a study group well, so that that way they're able to learn from other people more about the content that is challenging for them. On the other hand, though, um, not everybody struggles with test anxiety because of knowledge. Often it is very similar to any kind of performance anxiety. So thinking about something like public speaking or performing anything in front of a crowd, really. So we want to kind of hone in on at what point does this anxiety start? And that's where we want to make sure to start mitigating any of the symptoms of that anxiety. I love that. I feel like a lot of times people are like, oh, test anxiety only shows up when you're in the middle of the test. And you're like, oh, man, I didn't prepare enough. And it's it's so much more than that. There's a lot of um, psychology behind it, of course. And I know some students will kind of get a little scared by the word anxiety. We're not diagnosticians in CAP. We're not going to sit there and tell a student that they have some sort of a disorder. They might. That's not up for us to determine. Um, if a student does suspect that, then we might refer them out to somebody who can help diagnose them. If they do know already that they have a pre-existing anxiety condition, we're going to connect them with the Office of Disability Access to get help with that. But we can still provide coaching and some strategies to help them de-escalate the situation, I guess, when they are experiencing that anxiety. Yeah. So what kind what is the coaching strategy plan work? What does that look like? So as I said before, we're going to start with figuring out at what point does this anxiety kick in? If it is, you know, three days before the exam or if it's right before, we're going to look at how we can curb those difficulties. Um, but often what we'll start with is a plan to normalize the test taking experience. That's really what a lot of the strategies center around because thinking broadly, anxiety is basically the brain going, hey, we're in danger right now. And anything you're gonna do to curb anxiety is going to be trying to say, actually, we are perfectly safe right now. So we're trying to make sure that testing is less likely to trigger that fight, flight, or freeze instinct in us. Some of that can center around coming up with a whole routine around test taking to incorporate things that are enjoyable into preparing for a test as a way to kind of show the brain like, see, this isn't all bad. This is something you may never look forward to it. We're not here to lie to students and pretend like test taking is fun, but it might be something where it lowers the fight, flight, or freeze tendency simply by saying, hey, this is a normal thing. Some stress is okay. Some stress can help with focus and actually can help with memory recall. Where we want to really step in is when it's interrupting memory and recall because obviously that's where you get on the test and you can't remember anything you've studied. And you're like, I know I know this, but I don't remember anything anymore. So those that routine is definitely something we promote a lot with students. Another one of the major strategies we talk about is simulating the test taking experience regularly. So when they're doing practice questions, which I admit cap we bring up practice questions a lot in CAP. We love our practice questions. But it's just like a rehearsal for a play. You want to put yourself in that experience, set a timer when you're doing those practice questions, 
try to be, I always kind of jokingly tell students, if you can do it in a cold place, because I feel like testing is, every exam I've been in, yes. it has been freezing during the test. <laughs> so I'm like, have your environment be chilly. You can't get up and move around while you're doing it, um, unless it's maybe to you know go to the restroom or something, because usually you can do that during a test. But you want to set protocols that are very similar to the testing experience. Again, all with that effort of normalizing it so that your brain doesn't recognize it as a threatening situation. Yeah, no, I agree. One of my favorite tactics when I was in college was the rubber ducky method. It's I'm more not common familiar with that. It's more common amongst like coding in those professions oh. where you're reading, you know, for coders, you're reading the code to a yeah. duck to find um like the missing link. But for me, I was like, I just have to teach something else. Like yes. I have to teach what I'm learning to this little object that can't judge me. <laughs> so I'm like getting it wrong. <laughs> but that was always my favorite thing to do. And I learned how to do that like my senior year of high school, early into college. Yeah. Mock teaching is huge. That's a major study strategy I would say that we use a lot is encouraging students to explain it to somebody else because that's how you can really tell how well you truly know it. Yeah. That was, so. always, that was always my favorite way of studying. And I found it always like when I was in those testing environments, kind of like re-simulating it in my mind. Mm -hmm. I'm like, OK, like my pencil is my inanimate object <laughs> for this moment and just walking through the questions. And that was always really helpful. Um, but do you have any, like when they're walking into that testing environment, mm -hmm. what is like the first thing you tell them to do? Avoid other students. <laughs> um, that is Protocol number one is avoid other students right before and right after exams. Put on your headphones, listen to music. It can be calming music. It can be music to pump you up. What you want to do, though, is avoid other people. Inherently and instinctively, human beings are pack animals. So that means that when we see that other people are nervous, we pick up on that nervousness and it can trigger anxiety in ourselves. And so you might have been super confident driving to campus, and then all of a sudden you hear students say, oh, I'm going to bomb this test. I only got two hours of sleep last night. I'm so worried about it. My stomach hurts. And then your brain kind of goes, oh, they're scared of something. We should be scared of something, too. Avoid those conversations. Um, and I know you only asked about beforehand, but to explain why I also say to avoid other students afterward is when you have that kind of group comparison happening right after an exam. Everybody's talking about, oh, what did you put for, for this question? Mm -hmm. um, oh, I'm, I know that I got some of these wrong. I changed several of my answers. You know, this went horribly. Or sometimes even hearing someone be like, yeah, I aced that. And you know that you didn't. Mm -hmm. What that does is it perpetuates to your brain that this is a stressful situation that you need to be worried about. So that will then actually carry over to the next exam because you've just kind of had that confirmation that, yeah, even afterwards, people were scared of this thing. So I need to continue to be scared of this thing. <laughs> um, and I know I'm using the word scared instead of anxious. It kind of depends. Everybody experiences it a little bit differently um, as to how they want to label that feeling of nervousness. But really avoid other students as much as possible. <laughs> Um, right before and right after an exam. <laughs> That's so interesting. I've never heard of that. <laughs> Usually we tell students, we're like, oh, if you're feeling anxious, overwhelmed, seek out your support system. Yeah. And so that is kind of, and it makes sense. Like I think back, you know, when I would come out of exams and people, you know, say, oh yeah, like that was easy or, oh, that was so complicated. I'd be like, well, I thought it was easy. So am I not like as yeah. smart as you like what is happening did I did I get everything wrong and I just thought it was right and then yeah. you're just nervous about getting your grade back yeah mm -hmm. definitely I'm a very anxious person just in general <laughs> so I think a lot of my passion for working with students who struggle with test taking anxiety just comes from that firsthand of experience mm -hmm. of questioning myself questioning my knowledge and then I get a test grade back and it's way better than I thought it was going to be um, or I thought I did really well and it was way worse than I thought it was going to be. And it's a lot to deal with. Our students are so competitive. Our students are such high achievers on this campus. And I understand how hard it is because 
a lot of students are sort of trained to place their value in their grades. And grades are important, don't get me wrong. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, sure, it's gonna come up at some point, but it's one of those situations where there's so much emphasis put on test taking starting from when we're very, very young. Testing anxiety is usually not new. Sometimes it is, mm -hmm. sometimes students don't experience it till they get to this level. But for a lot of students, it's something they've always struggled with simply because we put such an emphasis on the importance of test grades. And when you're at this level, you're gonna be a PA, you're gonna be a physician, you're going to be working in public health. It's actually the knowledge, it's the underlying knowledge, it's the ability to work with other people, it's the skill sets that are so important. Yes, you have to make the grades to continue in the programs and potentially to get certain residencies. I'm never gonna deny that. But one of the conversations I do have a lot with students who are experiencing testing anxiety is we have to take our identity out of our grades. Mm -hmm. We have to separate those two things because grades are only a very small piece of data and so much of that can be impacted by a rough time getting to campus, you know? Mm -hmm traffic was terrible, so now your anger is up and you're not able to concentrate as well, or maybe you didn't sleep very well last night, and so you know you know this stuff, but your memory isn't working properly because you didn't get enough sleep. There are so many factors beyond just do you know it or not when it comes to test taking, and again, not saying that tests are not important, that students should just ignore their grades, but it's about reducing the hold that it has over you. Yeah, no, I love that, reducing the hold. I have a lot of students who, I'll check in them when we're like tabling or doing events. I'm like, oh, like you had an exam a couple weeks ago. How did it go? And you know, they immediately kind of ghost white. They're like, yep. um, and what is your like best recommendation? So you say avoiding students before and after the exam, but when they're waiting for that result, mm -hmm. how do you, like what's your best, you know, kind of aftercare? Um, distraction, honestly, because if you're just thinking over and over again about how that exam went, there's nothing productive you can do. The test is over. And I know personally, you can't just say, well, just let it go. Don't worry mm -hmm. about it anymore. It's over. That's not how, <laughs> that's not how people work. That's false toxic positivity. We're not going to do that. What I do often tell students is, if you can, and obviously this is dependent on their schedules and how much they have to get done, but if they can schedule something for after their exam that is fun and distracting, um, things like go down to Movie Tavern that's off West 7th and just catch a movie that afternoon, something that'll grab your attention. You won't be thinking about the test the whole time. Take that time to just shut your brain off to school. Have coffee with a friend who's not in the program, because again, we want to avoid the rehashing of the test. Um, it's okay if you do want to look up information you were unsure of, but you, I would encourage students to pause before they do that, rather than just immediately after the test, look it up and find out whether you got it right or wrong. Give your nerves a chance to settle and give your nervous system a chance to kind of calm down mm -hmm. um, before you start looking into it. Because then you can also question, is this actually beneficial? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's helpful to know. I just have to, I just have to know, did mm -hmm. I get this right or wrong? Because it's bugging me. Okay. If that answer is going to give you peace, great. Go double check it. If it is simply a way to punish yourself so you can sit there and be going, oh, yeah, I definitely got that wrong and I got that wrong. Oh, look at me messing everything up again. Mm -hmm. Don't engage in those behaviors. The more you feed the beast, if you will, <laughs> the stronger it grows. And so that aftercare is really about distracting yourself and f determining what level of look back is healthy. Um, something else that actually can be really helpful too, and I've worked with several students who have done this in the past, where they would just automatically schedule an appointment with a learning specialist for not necessarily the day of their exam, but maybe the next day, 
um, or the day that they get their grade because they know that they tend to have a very stress-filled reaction. And so we can look at their grade together. We can debrief together. Um, it's good to have somebody on the outside who can start asking you questions like, okay, does this grade match up with how you felt you did? If yes, honestly, that's a good thing. That means that you're good at gauging your level of knowledge and your performance. Even if it was like, I knew I didn't do very well and I didn't do very well, that is still helpful because we can sit there and say, okay, well, let's pinpoint why you didn't do as well. Maybe you didn't study enough or maybe you didn't study the right way. Maybe you haven't been taking care of yourself and you haven't been getting regular sleep. I could talk for hours about the importance <laughs> of sleep Same. on memory and performance. It's so critical. Um, but it could also be when there is a huge difference in how they felt like they did and what their actual, actual score is. We also need to figure out what's going on there. Typically, this is where one of the big things with testing anxiety comes up, which is I went back and changed answers. Mm -hmm. And so then we unpack why, you know, what made you question yourself? And also, here is the scientific reason why changing answers is not the best thing to do, unless you know for sure that you need to change your answer. So... Um, and if you want, I can kind of outline that for you because I love talking about these things. <laughs> but when it comes to changing answers, I know a lot of people hear, hear that, that like, oh, yeah, don't change your answer. Usually your first instinct is right. But no one ever explains why that is. And so I think people kind of ignore it and they're like, that's great advice for somebody else, but not for me. Really what it is, is it's a difference in long term memory and short term memory and their inability to really talk to one another well. Um, our subconscious brain, which is the one we can't really feel, has a lot stronger connection to that long-term memory. When we see a question and we have that answer come to us and we can't really pinpoint where that answer came from, usually that's gonna be your long-term memory going, oh, hey, I know this, we studied this. But then we start questioning it because the short-term or conscious area of our brain, and this is all very simplified, so if any, you know, neuroscientists are listening to me, please forgive me. Um, but that short-term memory or that active working memory can't explain why we came up with this answer. Mm -hmm. And that's where it gets so easy to start questioning. And especially when you can see, oh yeah, and there's another viable option here too. Um, the thing is, most of our exam questions on this campus are set up to where you can narrow it down to two answers, and then you have to pick the better one. That is just kind of I how. Those. I hate those. <laughs> I do too, um, but we won't go into that right now. Um, but this is where you start getting that back and forth of, but this was my first answer choice, so I should stick with it, but this other one I can make an argument for. So my rule of thumb and this does play into the test taking anxiety because I feel like this helps reduce decision fatigue a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. Unless you can disprove your first answer, don't change it. If you go back and you're like, oh, I misread the question or, oh, I remembered this piece of information and I know that answer is wrong because of X, Y, and Z, absolutely change it. Don't keep an answer you know is wrong but don't base it on whether or not you can make an argument for another one, just can you make an argument against that first one? I love that. I was always somebody, like my test anxiety showed up in me taking like tests in 15 minutes and then being done. <laughs> like I just, yep. I went through it, but I stuck to it because I was like, I don't have like the patience or the time to go back and check yep. my answers. <laughs> I was like, I just need to be out of here. And I remember taking like a 75 question test in less than 20 minutes. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I made like a high 80 on it. And I was like, okay. I was like, that I was hate. your, your subconscious was going, hey, we know this. We studied this. <laughs> yeah. And so it's always so interesting seeing how testing anxiety kind of shapes people and how mm -hmm. they approach exams. Cause I always knew going in, I was like, the information somewhere inside yes. me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if it comes out. 
Um, but that's always so interesting. Does CAP have any like online resources for test anxiety or any other resources you would recommend to help students? So on the CAP Canvas pages, we do have different modules that cover different topics. So we have like the five-step study system. Um, we have, I believe, a stress management page, which can also play into um, I always encourage students to incorporate some of those stress management techniques into that test taking routine piece. Um, again, just to help normalize it and make it somewhat enjoyable to prepare. <laughs> um, we have information over test taking strategies as well, not necessarily specific to anxiety, but just how to take a test because that in and of itself is a skill. Um, and then I think though, especially for those who are experiencing testing anxiety for the first time or are having it get worse after joining one of our programs, that is when it's a really good idea to talk to somebody because we can also help you sort out, was this temporary to this particular course? Or is this a larger issue at hand? Is this something where, for example, if you're starting to get really bad physical symptoms, you know, you're actually having GI conditions and you're sweating heavily and things like that, we may not be able to help very much because this might have gone beyond just test taking anxiety and may need, you know, therapy or counseling to help you work through what's going on that's causing such a strong reaction around exams. So Yes, I do think a lot of the information on our CAP Canvas page can be helpful because it's all to help you prepare effectively for exams and also just to make sure you're learning effectively. But ultimately, I think those one-on-one -on -one conversations are the most beneficial for test-taking anxiety specifically. Definitely. I agree. Um, is there any other advice you have regarding test anxiety? Um, while you're on the test, if you notice any any symptoms, you know, you're starting to go blank or your thoughts are starting to spiral, um, you're having trouble breathing or anything. Counted breathing is always a good exercise to kind of help recenter yourself. So doing the take a deep breath mm -hmm. and slow count of four, hold it, slow count of four out, things like that to help regulate your nervous system are good. But something that is sometimes missed with those deep breathing exercises is they're not going to work if internally you're still going through the motions of, oh, I don't know anything. Oh, I shouldn't be in this program. Oh, I'm going to fail this test. Oh, what are my parents going to think? <laughs> All the deep breathing in the world is not going to help if you don't have a way to, I don't want to say combat that inner voice, but work with that inner voice. Mm -hmm. It's just like any kind of bullying is the simplest mm -hmm. way I can say it. Where if you fight back, that's what the bully wants. They want to see you upset. They want you to have a reaction. The same goes with those anxious thoughts in your head. The more you listen to them, even if you're trying to fight against them, the stronger they tend to be. So the other thing that I tell students to do if they're experiencing it during the exam, focus on what is actually true in this moment. And that doesn't mean that we're doing oh, everything's going to be great. I am going to do, I'm going to get a hundred on this, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get a perfect score and everything's going to be absolutely wonderful. It's more about saying, yes, this is stressful. You know, we do want to validate the fact that this is stressful. Mm -hmm. Test taking is stressful and that's okay that it is stressful. Um, also reminding yourself of things like I did study for this. Mm -hmm. I did prepare. I did get accepted into this program. That's something I remind students of a lot is all of our programs on campus are competitive. They select students on purpose. Mm -hmm. You are here in this room taking this test on purpose. And centering yourself in what is true, I haven't failed this exam. Mm -hmm. I'm still taking it right now. I do have a chance to do well. It's So it's not about going so far into positivity and it's also not about listening to the super negative mm -hmm. voice. It's how do I find a middle ground that I can't really argue with because, again, it's centered around what is true right in this moment. And doing that combined with whether it's just having one or two phrases like that, like, I know this is stressful, but I still have a chance to pass. Saying that, repeating that internally while doing some deep breathing 
can go a long way toward helping someone kind of recenter and start fresh with a question in front of them. Mm -hmm. I love that. Always reminding yourself, like you're in the seat because you were chosen to be yes. in the seat. <laughs> wasn't a fluke, wasn't a fail. Imposter syndrome is real. So it is. It is a hard one to get past, but definitely. But I appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you for all the advice. Where can students find CAP? We are in the Student Service Center on the second floor. Um, you can email us at cap at unthsc.edu, or you can schedule an appointment with us through Simplicity. Awesome. And if you ever need somebody to chat, like Shannon said, care team's available at 817-735-2740, or you can email them at careteam at unthse.edu. But thanks. Thank you for having me. Yeah.